you, you were invited to do something at the break. And I'm curious how you found Actually, I'm curious who did something. <laughs> and this is what's going to happen with our class. <laughs> because your client comes back. Having been a parent, a worker, a friend, a community member, they're not just doing personal growth. Yes, personal growth, change, those are very important things. That's not everything. And sometimes they're doing other things. Thank you. You've done it. You've done it. Do play with this exercise if you like. This helps us conceptualize ourselves. What are the things that hold us back, get in the way of what they get in the way of? What is us? What do we do? What do we do to seek relief? What do we do to pursue what we care about? Now, I would like a quick step back and a quick refresher so that we are all on the same page. Inner and outer experiences. Any questions about that? Moves away and moves toward. Now, I wonder if you notice something very unique about those moves. Now, I'm an health profession, so I think a lot of the times people ask me for motivation. And I think it's a bit of a, you're motivated. Even if you sit on the couch, you're motivated to sit on the couch. Now, how are we motivated? Why is a big difference? And if you think about human, actually, I say humans, a donkey can be motivated with sticks or carrots. Both work. Sticks leave a very battered donkey. A donkey that doesn't trust you, carrots, do the opposite. The laser night vision side donkey. It's really healthy. It's <laughs> you know, the source of carrots. I don't know if you're noticing here. We're not donkeys, of course. We motivate ourselves. So here, I don't want pain, so I move. I'm stress, I move. No anxiety, I move. This is our parents. I want love in my life. I will I want care. I want compassion. I believe in freedom. This is a very different way of motivating ourselves. This is a very different human motivation to this one. Love work. They feel very, very good. Six carrots. Does that make sense? They are inner sticks and inner carrots. A much more compassionate, kind way of motivating these humans. All right. And while we're talking about compassion and kindness um, and freedom, and, and freedom, so in my work, I, I used to be a very um, angry young man. I used to feel stuck. I used to feel so stuck. And I don't know if you're familiar with Tara Brass, uh, metaphor about Mohini, the Bengal tiger, who they build this beautiful enclosure for. But it takes them a couple of years, so in the meantime, Mohini is kept in 12 by 12 cage. And when she released into the beautiful, almost like natural habitat like enclosure, she actually gets very anxious. And this is, we're talking about a natural athlete, this beautiful predator that cowers in the corner and starts facing, just anxiously stops sleeping, wearing out a 12 by 12 piece of what well, without grass. I think we have mental cages too, aren't they? Still can't. <laughs> I think the work I do, the work I do is motivated by the value of helping people find, find freedom. There are things that guard my cage. There are things that scare me, that 
get in the way of getting out and pursuing the life I want. This is a motivator very much to stay inside. This is a motivator very much to create the life you are doing. So this is a ref kind of refresher of what we've done in the first session. Do you have any questions about it before we move on? And we have two more sessions and um, very limited time. And I had to kind of think of well, pluck out what, what are the things that people would want to work on specifically within that. We've done an overview and I would like to narrow us down. I think the way that people present now is in a big way. They present because they want to get rid of something. Often people will come because they're anxious because they just lost, right? And I thought that the next part we will do on pain. And then the part after that, we'll do a bit more on relationships. And simply because we all have them, your clients have them, you have one with your clients. Right? So so far is that okay with everyone? We're about to go into pain. And I'm a psych in the community. Pain is my bread and butter. That makes that's Yours as well? Is that your experience too? Yes. And I'm a psych, so I don't believe there's a difference between physiological or psychological pain. I believe all is pain, and if he's done. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I just guess, in, in, a, in a way, pain is also a simple word for trauma as well, in that sense. Simple way of looking. Trauma is absolutely part of what I don't want in my life. Therefore, it's painful. Without that, loss, absolutely, absolute stress, by panic, shame, some more painful stuff that I can experience. Rejection, criticism, right? <laughs> and this is this is this is us. We've all had it. No one here not suffered. So let's let's do a bit of work on pain. And I find that probably the most sorry, Stalin. Yes, that was Stalin and the Churchill. Okay, I uh, see. Uh, I got distracted there. We are here. <laughs> What I'm hoping for is that after what we will do, you'll be able to clearly kind of um, have an idea of why you can have two people on a roller coaster, one going woo, and the other going woo. Right? The roller coaster doesn't have to change. In fact, if you measure these people's um, biofeedback, you see that their heart rates, Respiration, galvanic skin, you smell the cortisol levels, the level of glucose that they even have fires into their bloodstream are all up there, fight, flight, freeze, and fright. Both on the same roller coaster. Both going through their survival response. And one is having a blast, the other one is having a terrible time. They're doing something different here. I'm hoping we can kind of nut it out. I find a really useful place to start talking about, oh, about pain is talk about tattoos. Now, um, I don't have tattoos, right? Sorry? It's painful. It's painful, I know. <laughs> and I'm sure that you can think of people in your world that have a tattoo. You, you can think of a person, and I guess that that person has more than one. Isn't that amazing? If you think of a person with a t one tattoo, they go back. And sometimes they guess it wrong. And the person has one, and is saving for another one. <laughs> or there is an artist working on a design for another one, and so on. But people go back. And I, as a side, I think that's fascinating. What goes on there? I actually asked a couple of the two artists and um, read a Wikipedia article and another article and watched a couple of videos. I understood that um, 
There's a huge variation in the experience, and normally the first experience you'll go for is somewhere around the hour, so the land a little bit of them. And people go nuts, several hours, multiple sittings, layers, colors, and so on. Um, I don't know, when, I don't know if you, you spoke to people who say they're addictive, exciting, if it's a young person will say, awesome, right? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm a grown man. I go for um, one meal strike um, usually a year in that. And I have this thing where I want to live through this experience fully and I kind of want to look at it and wait. And I still have this involuntary cringe every time. And here's a whole population in my community that will sit through extended periods of time where the artist will wipe the blood and continue striking the already raw effect of it, creating more tissue damage, and these people walk away saying that it was somehow addictive exciting. So I want us to... <laughs> the very visible response, right? <laughs> I want us to learn something. Let us package this physiology and change nothing about it. And the person you thought of, think of a fake name for that person, and let us so apply and tweak the circumstances and apply that physiology against that person's work. Let's say that instead of choosing to go for their first tattoo to the tattoo parlor, it is forced on, I don't know, magic tattoo enthusiasts. Without this person understanding, knowing what, choosing to do anything with it, gets dragged down the dark alleyway somewhere, and then forced to go through that very experience. Needle strikes, duration, amount, depth of the needle punch. What would that be like? Nice. And what would it feel like? Painful. Incredibly painful, painful. painful. distressing. Yeah. What level of distress are we talking about? Five. Over ten. Four <laughs> True. Stupidly, this is Sorry. this is my way of you're right. You're right. It, it, against my will, so if that person's mind is anything like my mind, we start firing off scenarios. I'm going to die, get sexually assaulted, mutilated, I'm going to get dismembered, tortured, and so on, right? Not knowing how long this is going to last, what it's about, what it's for, every minute will last like an eternity. And I chose this picture. That two guns look scary. This is what else. This picture will demonstrate. They look scarier than my dentist tools. There is more than one. Um, would I ever go for any tattoo ever again after it was forced on me? Of course not. In fact, if I've gone through something like this, it kind of changed me in some very profound way. That's what trauma is, that's what torture is. I'll probably require some support to recover from this experience. Now I want to know, what did we, what did we tweak to go from, I don't know, <laughs> that's Google image search for <laughs> What did we tweak to take an exciting experience, change nothing about the physiology and make it traumatic tortures? Shorts. Do you, do you notice how powerful willingness is? Mm -hmm. Now, willingness to experience something, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be aside for a second. Let's, let's just call it a struggle switch. That's what Russ calls it, and I think it's a really useful way to, to speak about it. Struggle switch. It's not emotion, it's not a thought. It's biologically wired. We believe that too much, we believe this. Uh, it's not really clear. But let's stick with two positions you can be either willing or averse. We don't believe you can be anywhere in between. You can choose how long for to be willing for or to be willing to experience what. We don't believe you can be half half. Um, let me ask, why on earth would I have a version? Why would my mind and body give me such horror? What for? Why would. 
protection. It's my protection mechanism. Fight, flight, freeze, and fright. Fight, flight, freeze, and fright. In a dark alleyway, yes, get very distressed. And I don't know why. <laughs> Cunningly wait for them to make a mistake and strike out and break his sticks. Or panic and scream and, 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 and get some help or, or, or break free. Um, you probably intimidate them and tell them that your dad is in a bikey gang or something. I don't know. <laughs> Fright. You probably, you only be your pasta. You can be left alone. Free. Yes. Right? This is our minds and bodies protecting us. Very good. So that's aversion and willingness. Now, this, because it's a survival response, it needs to be incredibly fast. How fast? Someone kicks a ball toward my face, I detect it in the corner of my eye, and execute a conflict. Appraise it as a threat, actually, as unpleasant, and potentially injurious. Squiggly. Forgive my squiggly, that was crazy. <laughs> and spiky. So, and execute a complex multi muscle deflecting, ducking, racing action way before I have a chance to think anything about it. Faster than dog. Way before I have a chance to feel anything about it. Faster than emotion. What that means is you don't get to read a Facebook post, accept that which you cannot change, and just turn it on. It's faster than that. So, all right, and we share that with our animals. It works very kind of, um, well, I come to the edge of a cliff, my eyes will exaggerate how high it is, my mind will tell me I'm going to die, my body will feel heavy GBs, and I'm in the back, right? This is how it works. Simple. We share it with other animals, threats in the outside world that I perceive as unpleasant, squiggly, potentially injurious, spiky. My body and mind will respond with what position? Uh, very good. Aversion, avoidance, don't get hit by a bus. Very simple. We share this with other animals. Humans do one day. I can believe my stress kills me. We go to anger management courses. I believe my anxiety is a disorder, depression, which is a disease. I can phrase my internal experience as unpleasant and potentially injurious. No other species can do that. We are the only species who can freak out about fear. <laughs> I can be afraid of fear. I haven't been for a long time. I don't know if you've experienced that. So in that place, if I perceive my own aversion as a threat, then my mind and body will respond with If I perceive my own private inner experience as unpleasant, potentially injurious, my mind and body will respond to that with what? Struggle switch position. With aversion, which I perceive as a threat. This is a model of human suffering. I don't panic, I don't panic, I don't want to panic, oh here it comes, I can feel it, and I'm panicking. Some bad news about this, you do this, I do this. We don't have a choice, we are incredibly intelligent. And the model of cognition that we have now, relational frame theory, can explain why this happens. My other species don't know that. Zebra doesn't run away from a line and goes, I can't believe Steve was taken. Shouldn't it be me? <laughs> it goes back to grazing. Bobby? Getting love, life is great right now. We don't do that. Some bad news about it again. If you've done this and you've done this, you got better and better and better at this. More bad news about this, it's thread optional. We can be one of the richest savers in the world. Let's try it. And disintegrate into a panic attack in a shopping center, one of the most comfortable places. Right? Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Terrifying experience. So, 
so this is as far as bad news go. Uh, we'll come out of this. But I would like to do something with this now. I would like to ask you, in, and I, I've got to want, not one, ask your permission uh, to track it. In that, I'll invite you to wander into a whole bunch of solutions, whole like solutions that we've all tried and that only maintain this very cycle. So, would that be okay if I kind of gone, see, that's why it works? Is that all right? Can I invite you to give me normal, everyday solutions that people try to address this? What would people do? Rationalize it. Rationalize it. We, we think that we can put that solve that I've done this. <laughs> yes. What else? Consoling. Breathing exercises. Consoling. Consoling. And notice, we do things to stop the feeling, and the very thing we're doing to stop the feeling just trains us further and further that the feeling must be stopped. We train ourselves to be afraid of our own private experience. So have private experiences of private experiences. In a way, we train ourselves. As an example, I could wake up and have a great day. I could wake up with, what do people do? Happy, energetic, confident, worthy, uh, um, motivated, right? And it's probably great, it feels great, energized, I'm ready to go and have a great day. I have a lot to do today, I'm loving this day, I really hope this feeling doesn't end. So now I'm dreading the end of a good feeling. Oh, come on, come on, come on. So now I'm stressed about the dread of a good feeling. Bah! So now I'm frustrated about the stress of the dread of the feeling. I'm actually ashamed of this kind of a person. So I'm supposed to notice private experiences on top of private experiences. The world done this. It happens so fast, we don't even know. We, we talk about primary, secondary emotions. This happens so fast <laughs> that there are layers on top of layers. Um, so what do we do? What do our clients do? What would we, what would we try to do? Where to? I would try and stop the thought. Very good, very good. A pothole I've been in many times. Don't think, don't think, don't think, oh no, I'm thinking. And the thing is too, oh, Jane and I saw the best sign last night. Unsee the sign. What is, is that right? Don't think this. And what happens? That. I'm going to bring it up in the workshop the next day. Right? Perfect time with that. Don't know what they were advertising. It's still great. And if you if you, is it quite very good. If you curious to know more about this, there's been polar bear research that was running. I don't know if you're familiar with these studies where they would get participants to watch a documentary about polar bears. Half of these participants would be told, try to minimize how many polar bear thoughts you're having. And then they both measured on a bunch of things. Some of those are just distracting questions, and some of those are about how many thoughts about polar bears these people have. And try to guess which one, which group had more polar bears. <laughs> the ones that had the instruction, don't think about it. And it gets really tricky for us humans. We are such problem solvers. Mary had a little... And is there a way that you don't have land pop up in your brain? Is there a way? And people try. People... Mary had a little shoe. Little shoe had a little shoe. Next time you go to tie your shoe, it's a lamb. <laughs> Relational framing, remember? Friends get connected. So let's not do that. Other potholes you're familiar with? Normalizing. Normalizing. You avoided a lot of potholes. <laughs> so, what would normalizing do? 
What does normalizing peace and also support? Is that right? Uh, support. I think consoling. What does it do for us? It's okay for me. It's okay. It goes back to what we call clean experience. Clean experience, and you cheated here, I bet. Because we would know it. And one of the potholes that we are now falling into. Destruction. Absolutely. Destruction, stopping, changing, very good. And removing of the threat. And notice how far away I am from my birthplace. You run and run and run until you realize that that comes with wherever you go. And that comes with. We stop talking to our family members, we change jobs, partners, right? That comes with wherever you go. And what are the potholes that we missed? Addiction is a really good example of trying not to feel. And how terrified. Have you seen the panic? The panic of not being able to stop this. We, we destroy lives just to stop this thing. Of course, very powerful. We hate it. We hate it, humans. We hate it. And the thing is, once we hate it, we create another layer. And this is another hole that we fall into. If we perceive that this cycle is a problem, it looks like a problem to me. Well, now it's unpleasant, potentially injurious, and now I have a version about the cycle of aversion. This is our human experience. This is how clever we are. And this is kind of a little bit about our suffering. That's why we suffer the way we suffer. I mean, if you have a pet who come back from surgery, they don't do what we do. They're ready to go. They have to be protected from themselves with the lump shape. Right? We don't do that. What is that? Is that normal? Should it be there? We freak out about freaking out. They don't. So, what you said before about normalizing and bringing it back to clean experience, so I will be willing to open up to my heart. Willing to have pain. Willing to have pain, and you remember the tattoo experience, the difference between willing to have pain and averse to pain. Did you notice how powerful the switch is? Now, I would like everyone to have this experience. I would like to take you through one. Is that all right? I will, I will take you through a meditative kind of an exercise where everyone will have a chance to feel what it's like to be open and willing to have their inner experiences open and willing. But before we do that, I would like to run a quick quiz. Trust, is that okay? Just to make sure that we're on, on, on track here. True story uh, told by Dr. Maya Tuili, who does a lot of work with anxiety of CIS. Bless him. Was um, the editor of the journal of contextual behavioral science. So he tells this story where they tried to put together uh, an experimental protocol for anxiety disorders with panic attacks. So they selected 12 participants who had three panic attacks a day, uncued. Can you imagine that suffering? Can you imagine these people were exhausted and they were prepared to have any experimental protocol against it to just stop it, make it stop, make it stop? They were put into a university based facility and wired with a bit of biofeedback stuff to show the researchers when they become agitated. And um, 12 participants, three panic attacks each. How many panic attacks did they expect in the facility? 36 they expected in the facility on the first day. 36 panic attacks. Take a guess how many they got. Nine. On the very first day of the study, they got less than one a day. Now, in the academic world, if we got nine after three weeks of intervention, we all tap ourselves on the shoulder, write a nice paper about it, and get a grant to do something more, right? On the first day, that's a failure. They had to stop the experiment. They had to re-interview all the participants to get a sense of what did they do different. Now that's your question. What did these people do that was different? 
Please, please. Was it that they felt that they were surrounded by so many professionals that they were in good hands and calmed down? I think they were willing to no. have a panic attack for science. You are absolutely right. For the first time in their life, these people were like, here is my panic attack treated. Here. And you cannot have a panic attack if you are willing to have a panic attack. Let me say this again. You cannot have a panic attack if you are willing to have a panic attack. And I don't know why the wider community doesn't know this. You cannot. And unfortunately, the way academic process works, a failed study like this doesn't get published. This is something that I think we need to know. You cannot have a panic attack if you are open to having one. Just got you. <laughs> Now, what are they doing different? One is having last, the other one is having a terrible time. Same roller coaster, same um, fight, fight, prison, fight response. What are they doing different? Two. Different anticipating maybe our perception. Different idea on perception. What are they doing different? Very actually. I know, one is having last. And that's why we have a job. We can't change our clients all of us this sometimes. Not their past, not their genetics, not their family, not their relationships. On the bank account, kind of a cheap mine. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing? Um, the person enjoying it is totally in the moment. The person not enjoying it is creating all the movies, present and future. Well, I think I think the guy that is enjoying himself is going, come on, I really love this, you'll enjoy it too, get on with me. And the other guy's going, oh, I don't know about this so much. He said, no, you'll, you'll love it. Oh, and he's against his best judgment, he's gone on and he's hating it. You're right. They're relating differently to their inner experience. It's not the roller coaster. And one of the mistakes we make is thinking that it's the roller coaster. Both of them, if you take them outside of that space, ask them, they will both agree that it's safer to go on a roller coaster than drive to and from. Once on the roller coaster, one is open to this experience. He's willing to have all of that, and roller coasters bring up all of our inner you know, kind of primal, very primal, inborn, sort of we're born with this stuff. Um, wind in your face, you ever do that to a baby, they panic, right? It's an inborn fear, rapid changes in altitude, do that to a baby, you will see them panic. Loud noises and so on, rapidly approaching objects, those are in a, our own, we're born with those things that indicate to us we're going to die. Right, babies are really good at freaking out. Very good. Open to aversion, they open to their inner. He is open to his inner experiences, he is not. Even their gestures indicate openness, or not openness, crazy. Does that make sense? 